Japantown was once a large part of Salt Lake City. It now currently consists of one street known as Japantown Street. Japantown Street was officially given the name formally in 2007 as a request from the Japanese community. The city has made small additions to Japantown Street as a gesture for the community and its undergone history. The city has included Japanese-inspired designs on the gates of the Salt Palace facing the Buddhist temple.
A developer will build a mixed-use development towards the back of Japantown Street. The Japanese Community Preservation Committee has been working with the city and the developer to come to negotiation of how the development can create minimum impacts on Japantown Street. I met with a few well-known members from the community and had a conversation about what impacts the removal of Japantown has made upon them and the community at large. I met with Irene Maya Oda, who works as a professor under the Department of Social Work at the University of Utah. Irene was born in Japan and came here being only a few months old. She shared her experience about being a Japanese American and what Japantown meant for her. The Salt Palace, right, plopped itself on there and they're encroaching. And they actually have been trying for years and years and years to get rid of the churches there. Um, they've got the one block is Japantown Street. Mm -hmm. Japantown was much bigger than one block, was much bigger than one block. We're from like Second South to North Temple, from Fourth West to State Street. It was much bigger than that one little block that they're calling Japantown Street. Um, and now they want to build this big high rise in, in the parking lot and it's, it's just gonna, it, it, yeah, it's, it's just really sad, it's really sad. Um, knowing everyone, I mean we, we all lived across the street from the, there's there was something called Whitmore Court, and that's where most of us lived, and it was across the street from the Buddhist temple. And so it was knowing all the kids, and knowing kids from the Buddhist temple, and knowing kids from the Japanese Church of Christ, and knowing, um, and feeling familiar, right? Just that feeling of familiar, and that nothing was strange, and eating Japanese food wasn't strange, and you know, at the, the new school, people would say, "Oh, you're eating, you're eating seaweed," and I never knew it was seaweed. It was nori, right? It was nori. And I said, oh, no, I'm eating nori. And go, oh, I mean, you're eating seaweed. Blah, you know, blah. And I'm like, no, it's nori. I don't know what you're talking about. And it was later I found out, oh, yeah, nori is seaweed, yeah. right? And so, yeah, in Japantown, it, it, right, church um, was always bilingual. Um, every time you had some kind of food event, it was always Japanese. Sushi was... Sushi was a norm, it, you know, before it became this big fad. You were, I mean, we were always eating sushi. Yeah. And, and my mom was known, as, you know, for her sushi and cooking and stuff. And so, yeah, so my memory is, is just that feeling of, of um, familiarity, of not feeling different, that community and knowing, you know, it didn't matter if the kids were Buddhist or if they were, or if they were Christian, we, it, we were, they had, they had, they had um, community, so across the street from the Church of Christ was a building called the Manse, mm -hmm. and, um, and another building that they owned, and they would have judo classes, lessons there, and um, Japanese language classes there, and so I, I remember we would check out the boys <laughs> doing judo, yeah, we would check out the boys. Toshiharu Kano works in the Public Works Department of Holiday and has experienced many health issues due to the exposure of radiation from the bomb in Hiroshima. His mother was pregnant with him when the bomb hit. Tosh has written a book about his experiences titled Passport to Hiroshima. He also talks about why Japantown meant so much for him and what it means for our community. I think the uh, uh since the Japanese people have uh, brought in their traditions from Japan to the United States, I think that is unique uh, part of the culture. Uh, in my opinion, it's part of the United States as a whole. Uh, talk about the uh, uh, diversity. And I think the Japanese uh, culture could contribute tremendously to our, uh, our community, like uh, Italians, French, uh, Norwegian, or Polish, or Jewish, or uh, Arabic people, or African people. They could all contribute to the diversity of our society.
because after all, America is a melting pot. And that's what's so unique about the America. Uh, I don't think there is no other country in the our, in our earth that is this diverse. Uh, we are all put together from the different countries and we are so unique. And that's what I love about America is because you don't have to go too far to experience diversity. And I think uh, if you take that away, America doesn't exist. Ted Nagata is a well-known artist and graphic designer of Salt Lake City. He was also imprisoned in Topaz as a child. <clears throat> I think every ethnic group should have something that they can look forward to. Yeah. But I think diversity makes Utah a better place to live. People like you and me, you know, we, we, make, we bring our cultures and uh, it's a much richer place than if it were all white. The area of the city where we all congregate and see each other, we miss that. And uh, <clears throat> I think the Chinese have established a place on South State, and they are in the beginning stages, but uh, it seems to be going pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The restaurants that were <clears throat> in the 50s going pretty strong, the U.S. Cafe turned into the Mikado, and the owner of the Mikado, Jerry Tsuyuki, told me that he was the first to bring a sushi bar into the uh, into the town, although before him was the bachi, and uh, they they were a going restaurant for ten years, maybe before Jerry started. Yeah. So there were quite a few Japanese restaurants. I mean, high class restaurants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there were many uh, like uh, Don Noodle on. First South was really a place where all the natives went to eat, and uh, there was a law office uh, by, run by Katayama, and many grocery stores on First South, and many barber shops. I, there were two that I know of, and if you go back far enough, uh, Tyra Tashima had a barber shop. And there were three pool halls, although we all played at the Star Pool. And uh, we had basketball leagues. There were many basketball leagues. We, we played baseball and football on the islands in the street mm -hmm. and at the Capitol Lawn. <clears throat> and I remember those, those were horrific games because the next day I would be so sore I could hardly walk. But uh, basketball was really the number one sport and for seven or eight years we held the biggest basketball tournament here in Salt Lake City and we had teams from California, San Francisco, Chicago, Denver, Idaho, and it was a big event, yeah. a very big, and the competition was really keen. Yeah. And we had a queen contest, and all those things are gone now, but good memories, yeah.
Yes, actually I was born in uh, Santa Monica, California. And uh, in the ensuing years we moved up to Berkeley, California. And we were incarcerated. Not because we were spies or saboteurs, but because we were Japanese. And I'm not talking about my family. 120,000 Japanese were uprooted from their homes, accused of being espionage agents, and without a trial, we were just put in jail. And we lost our homes, we lost our cars, we lost our businesses. Like my family lost everything. The government told us, oh yeah, we'll, we'll provide warehouses where you can store all your furniture and after the war you can have them all back. Well, what happened is the uh, warehouses were burglarized and ransacked and there was absolutely nothing left for us to come back home to. So. It was a sad history of the constitutional rights of American citizens. Most of us were American citizens, and we had committed no crime. But because we were Japanese, and because the people that bombed Pearl Harbor were Japanese, we were suddenly declared guilty because of our race. And, you know, I think Muslims today are going under the same scrutiny. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How old were you during that time? I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> after um, we, we were sent to a horse racing place and we had to live in a horse stall, believe it or not, while Topaz here in Utah was being built. And we were in Tantran for I'd say oh six months. And then Topaz was ready so they loaded us onto a train and took us to Delta, Utah and from there we were trucked out into the desert 16 miles and that was our first glimpse of topaz. And how long were you in the camp for? We were there three years. Okay. So including Tantran, we were incarcerated for three and a half years. Okay. What was it like in the camp? Well, living in a horse stall wasn't fun, mm -hmm. but uh, after four or five weeks, we finally got to move into a barrack. But the barracks weren't much better because the barracks were one room about 50 feet by 20 feet, and there were no walls. <laughs> So six or eight families had to live in a barrack and we had no walls, no privacy. So we set up string on the ceiling and we put blankets over the string and those became our walls. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't pleasant, yeah. How did you spend your time there as a child? What did you do to keep yourself busy? Uh, I played a lot. Uh, I probably drew a lot because I liked artwork. And my father was uh, working in a, uh, he made tools, you know. But we had a newspaper and we had a form of government and we tried to 
be as civilized as we could. But everybody was mad at why we were jailed. We didn't do anything. Yeah. And then <clears throat> on the train to uh, Utah, it was it was a rickety old train, and they told us to put the blinds down. I don't know why. It, some said for our protection, and some said so people would see us leaving the area. I don't know why, but it was a very unpleasant trip. And when you had to go to the bathroom, all the toilets were clogged. And so they'd stop every hundred miles, and everybody would get out and do their business and get back in the train, and it was hot. And um, it was a very unpleasant train ride. And when we got to Delta, they put us in the backs of these army trucks and, and took us 16 miles out into the desert. And um, it was so dusty and windy and hot that we couldn't even see the barracks until we were actually right there. And that was our first glimpse of uh, Topaz. And uh, we stayed there for three years. And some people got out earlier to go to school and whatnot, but we were the last family to leave Topaz. I don't know why, but we were. And it was like a ghost town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was <clears throat> right after the end of the war, 1945. But, you know, prejudice was still very present. And <clears throat> when we got to Salt Lake, there were many people that were antagonistic towards us. My father couldn't find a place to live, and he couldn't find a job, and my mother was sick from the experience at Topaz, she never really recovered. So me and my sister grew up really without a mother, although she was with us at, at the time, but she wasn't a mother. She was depressed and sick. And so my father didn't know what to do. He was trying to find a job and find a place to stay, and he had two ch young children to uh, look after, and finally he decided the best thing for us was to put us in an orphanage. And <clears throat> me and my sister went into St. Anne's Orphanage, and it's still there on 21st South. And <clears throat> That was the best part of my life, if I can say that, because for the first time I had a structured life. I could, I had to make my bed, and I had to say prayers three times a day. Up until then, I was just a wild kid. I just, nobody was taking care of us. And, <clears throat> I had to go to school taught by nuns, and um, I had KP duty, I had to peel potatoes, and it wasn't unusual, it was just part of every student's uh, duties. And we were there, I'd say, about a year and a half, and I learned a lot of things about life in that orphanage. And I recall one situation where there was a uh, cafe right across the street from our house. We lived right where the Salt Palace is. And <clears throat> there was a big sign in this cafe's window and it said, No Japs. And so 
I never went in there, of course, but today, that believe it or not, that building is still standing. And it's uh, right there on 1st South and about 3rd, 2nd West. And there's a Japanese sushi restaurant in it. Yeah. yeah. But I remember getting off the train, going into the Union Pacific uh, Depot and waiting there while my father went up to try to locate a place for us to stay. And we waited and waited and finally we fell asleep on these hard wooden benches and the next thing I know, my dad came to me and woke me up and he said he found a place for us to stay. And it turned out to be just a one room, ten, uh, about 10 by 10 feet. It had a stove and beds and there wasn't much room in it, but it was a place to stay. And we stayed there, I don't know, six months or so, mm -hmm. yeah, until we went into the orphanage. Did you feel free when you got released from the camp, or did you still have that feeling of... Well, I still mm -hmm. felt much prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we finally got into school, and school was much better than the neighbors. Uh, because I established some friends and uh, while I was in school I was treated pretty much like other students. Um, <clears throat> then they started talking about the atomic bomb and how it was so small but it was really a pretty big bomb but in school they were talking about how small it was. But, uh, <clears throat> I even today I don't think the United States had to drop a atomic bomb on Hiroshima just to tell people they were loaded. I mean they could have dropped it off in a remote area of Japan and and said, see this is what we have and it could demolish your cities. No, they didn't take that approach. In fact, they bombed a second city, Nagasaki. And <clears throat> by then, Japan had surrendered. And I don't know, about 200,000 people were killed. You know, when we got out of camp and we were still in Salt Lake during the 60s and 50s, um, there was a lot of prejudice going on because I, I remember when me and my wife got married and we were trying to look for an apartment to live in and people said, well, in, a, in so many words they said no, but yeah, we knew it was because of our race. And finally we found a place to stay and we moved all of our furniture and our washing machine and our stove and uh, refrigerator in and finally my wife and I said to each other, oh gosh, it's so nice to be able to settle down in a place. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the landlord came to us one day after we had moved in and said, I'm sorry, but your neighbors want you to leave. And so, I say that because uh, prejudice in 1958 was still very much alive, yeah. Judge Raymond Nuno is a respected leader of the community and is known as the first minority judge in Utah. He's also the president of the Japanese Community Preservation Committee, or JCPC, and was also imprisoned in Topaz camp. In the camp, there's no way for us to accumulate any money because the wages were something like fourteen dollars, sixteen dollars, the maximum nineteen for a, prof a professional person like a doctor, 
or engineer or something like that. And then for people who did just regular, um, like my mother worked in the kitchen, her, her salary I think was something like around $14 a month. And they gave us, I think, a small allocation so that we could buy some clothing and things. But we didn't accumulate very much. So when we left the camp, we practically left with just the clothes on our back and a few other things. And we went back to Ogden. And uh, my mother was able to get a job at a place called Estra Hall, which was a Methodist women's home. And although she's college educated, you know, because of uh, not being bilingual and not having any other skills, you know, she ended up being a domestic, so she became uh, a cook and a housekeeper for this domestic, um, Estra Hall. And uh, she continued that until she retired when she was 65 years old. I learned Judo in Japan when I came back, uh, they had a Judo club, a very strong Judo club, so I enrolled in that, and that had to be uh, right near Japantown. But anyway, from the time I was in high school, I always used to come to Salt Lake City, and the place we would go was Japantown. You know, you don't have to say, uh, you know where it is. You just say J Town, and we knew exactly where to go because it's a small, thriving, viable Japanese community, and it had increased a little bit during the war time because they had topaz, and so a lot of the people, not a lot, but people from topaz relocated here, and from other camps they relocated here. So the population sort of grew, you know, during that war time, and they had a really nice community. Had Puha, Judo Club, Credit Union, Barbershop, a lot of restaurants, mm -hmm. market, fish market, uh, you know, a lot of Japanese things. And so it was very convenient and, uh, you know, anytime you wanted to eat something uh, Japanese, we'd just go down there and, you know, there are three or four restaurants that we would go to. Anyway, I became very attached to Japantown and they had the Christian church there and the Buddhist church were just still there, which was just uh, west of sec uh, Second West and on First South. And you know, the people that were thrived and lived during World War II are now getting older, but they still had their businesses and could have continued on for you know many many years. You know, in 1947, lo and behold, they said they're going to build a salt palace. Oh, that's a good idea, salt palace. Well, we heard that the salt palace was probably built around 21st South and State Street, where the government building is. Well, that's a nice location for the salt palace, center of the you know community. <clears throat> And then when finally the bond was voted on and actual construction was going to take place, we find out that it's going to be on First South, right where Japan Town is. So in one fell swoop, they completely obliterated the heart of the, you know the Japanese community because they just all the businesses had to move. Yeah, nothing can bring it back, and, and, and I know there are people who want to bring it back. Nothing's going to bring it back. You can't create it. Japantown happened because of segregation, discrimination, prejudice, and fear. That's exactly how Japantown got started. No, you're not going to live next to us. No, you're not going to live with white Americans. No, you're not doing that. I mean, 
all the incoming immigrants were in that area, right? When the Greeks first came, when the Italians first came, um, when the Chinese came, when the Japanese came, that's where you went. And then I, I've done some critical space theory um, readings and and what happens, it can, can become a third space. So it's not in the very good part of town. The railroad was still working, but then it becomes a magnet um, space where Japanese immigrants will come. I mean, Topaz, right when Topaz was ended, the, the camp was ended, where were they Where were they supposed to go with $25, right? So they went to Japantown because they couldn't go anywhere else. The, it's, I mean, they're the enemy, right? Um, it was, I remember the stores. I remember the Again, the community, the feeling of community there. I remember the Pagoda restaurant was there. Um, Sage Farm Market, I think that's the only store that still exists. It's on 15th South in Maine. Um, but Sage Farm Market was there. A tofu shop was there. Um, family Market that sold the fresh fish was there. I mean, it's gone. And you can't bring it back. You, you're not going to bring it back there. That space now, what, there's the place where the jazz play, jazz play now. You think they're going to get rid of all that to rebuild Japan Town? I don't think so. And, and we'll see if that high-rise, multi-development um, is stopped. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say it, it's going to be built. I'm going to say where there's money involved, people don't care about, about Japan Town. I think uh, uh, I think that would be a good thing. Uh, I think uh, like in a Chinatown in San Francisco or Los Angeles, uh, it will bring people to that location because I think the uh, uh, being American is a diversity. They love diversity and they love to experience the different cultures. And, and so I think that will be a plus uh, in Salt Lake City, in my opinion. I don't, not, I don't think we should uh, try to, uh, to uh, diminish the, uh, uh, the, the little bit it's left in, in uh, Salt Lake City as a Japanese community. I think they need to expand it. And, and you notice to the west there's a Mexican community and I think they need to do the same thing as much as they can I don't know whether that's possible or not but the trend is they're trying to eliminate bit by bit and I'm afraid that someday they're going to Salt Lake City is going to succeed completely eliminating a Japanese uh, influence. So essentially, that just destroyed the Japanese. The only thing left were the two churches, but economically, those two churches don't provide any employment except for the pastors. So we continue to struggle and uh, we try to work with the city, the county, the state, uh, Chamber of Commerce to see if there's some way that we could establish a Japanese community either there or, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, they made a lot of promises of they'll try to do this or try to do that, but it was all essentially facade, you know. I mean, they, were, they had no intention of doing anything. And, you know, we, we thought about trying to do something with Japan Town, but, you know, we just couldn't get people interested in couldn't get it organized, but we wanted to establish sort of a minority community there, primarily having the Japanese, you know, concentrated and uh, preserve Japan town. Well, as much as we struggled and worked with the city, the county, and uh, whoever else we had to work with, we always were on the defensive, and the. Uh, whenever the salt family wanted to do something, put on a performance, or wanted to expand, it was always negative. You know, 
there's nothing we could do. We just have to live with it and hope and pray that they won't have all the manure on the streets when the road had the road there or you know in front of the churches and things like that. They wouldn't park all the trucks and things like that in front of the churches and while well, you know we have our activities. But it was a, a constant fight. We said that you know we need to have a Japanese community. You can't destroy the Japanese community. I think the Japanese people are one of these group of people that never complains. They just stay to themselves and work hard, study hard, improve themselves, and become part of the society. And so, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, Japanese people are considered to be not minority. They are not included in the definition of minority. They were like same as a white group. And uh, so I think the Japanese people have contributed quietly throughout the years and supported this country. I don't know, an understanding, an acceptance. I mean, even an acceptance, though, seems um, seems um, conditional, right? I'll accept you if, like, there's something to accept. Mm -hmm. So I wish I had the answer. I really do, because then I'd then I'd have my children be more included, and my grandchildren be more included, and accepted, and respected, and um, because they're not. Not. Through our schools here, K through 12, we learn a very narrow Eurocentric history. I mean, I don't even remember being told about the internment camps, and we had one, had one in Salt Lake. We had one in Salt Lake, but in Utah and Delta, I don't remember being told about that. And, uh, there are a lot of number of Buddhist churches that are not Japanese, but you know they come from Southeast Asia, China, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge not only for us here, but it's a challenge for the people in the United States of America how to assimilate and continue to have a free and you know, viable society integrating all these different kinds of things. And, uh, I keep thinking to myself, you know, how, how can this be brought together? And particularly since the United States, and right now is really the most dangerous time, I think, and I can remember of uh, you know, what, what might happen. And uh, I'm always afraid of, you know, for my children and the, and the younger generation. There. A community is a mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared and that the people who share the place define and limit the possibility of each other's lives. It is the knowledge that people have of each other, their concern for each other, 
their trust in each other, the freedom with which they come and go among themselves. Wendell Berry. <laughs>